many years, one of the involvements that we had during disasters was to really have this outpouring of volunteerism. And really, when I was in high school, I remember the first disasters. There was a typhoon. We would donate clothes. Uh, but more than that is my parents were heavily involved in going to these relief centers. We could almost count it, tatlong sandok ng uh, rice, three, three bags of rice, uh, sardines. And then I used to remember candles and maybe some medicine. And then when I was in college, there were other disasters. And we used to go almost every year and got, get bags and bags of food and also up to, you know, almost every year after that. And I used to remember, no matter what position I was, was all that I can do to help these people just go out and wrap bags of food. As my, you know, as I would get into, you know, my urban planning and, or, or more technology, I'd say, is that all that the Filipinos can do to help people there? There's no technology. Is there no higher value that we, that we can create? When disaster strikes, one of the things that really happens is uh, people lose everything. They lose, lose all their access for food, electricity, medicine. And, and one of the key things about going after that is more and more people don't want to go to refugee centers because sickness would arise, and most of them would like to live in the darkness of their home, sometimes six to eight months when trees fall, cutting off electricity. And then that became my passion. How can we create something within 72 hours. That's what the United Nations have as a time, 72 hours. How can we get food, water, energy to, to people there? Unfortunately, there is a saying, very popular, the UN builds the refugee camp. Ah, sorry, the UN, the UN builds the camp. The refugees build the city. What looks like a big relief is often just a small little impact. They help a small group of community, just like a white paper with a dot in the center. Nobody ever thinks about looking at the rest of the white paper. Who helps them? So one of the passions that I've done is really, how can I work with people to be able to create a solar lighting solution within 72 hours of light? Father I, you know, he is very familiar with, uh, uh, you know, I'm from Ateneo, and that's, that's not a bad thing. And, and one <laughs> so one of the things that I was very inspired was, you know, the logic of, you know, the breaking of the bread and the wine, you know, there was people go to the mount and they were there for, you know, the whole day and they were said, you know, you could go back to the city, just eat there and come back. But the Jesus said, no, uh, and I'm not, you know, I'm not talking on a religious basis, but what I'm saying is just think about this when, when uh, Jesus said, can you uh, ask them to just donate a bread, bread and wine? And we all know the story how this one, it multiplied, everybody was fed, and there was more to spare. But really what I want to talk to you about is about the value of sharing. That when the first person shared, the guy said, hey, I didn't come all the way here to the top of the hill with nothing. I, I actually have a whole bag na nakatago that's, that's hidden. And so, hey, you know, you share, I'll share. And then the next guy goes there and says, you know, I have also a lot of stuff. He also opens it and starts sharing. And, and next thing you know, is everybody had more than enough. And, and this is what I was thinking. What if we create this army of people that if I share the technology, how to build solar lights? That it's not this highfalutin, you know, uh, idea that you have to manufacture it abroad, that if you patent it abroad, then we can only bring it into the country that that would be able to, you know, to solve it. So what we wanted to do is, what, uh, what if it's not bottom up? What if it's top down? What if I am able to train an army of solar makers, solar engineers, and when the disaster strikes, we make a call to all of you and said, look, we've got a donation of many parts. Can you help us build thousands and thousands of solar lights? So this was, this was a dream. And it all began really with this experience of being in the center and starting out really with one thing, which is a plastic bottle. We saw these plastic bottles and said, you know, all of these donations are coming in. Let's not start out with some few, you know, uh, plastic injection molding. We really come from a heritage of taking these plastic bottles, getting volunteers to fill it with mud, 
and then dry it, just simple mud from the river. And then what we would do is we would tie it, and then we would put it together. We would use, uh, because we did not have that much stuff to bring there, we had uh, metal bars. We used chicken feathers to make the cement strong. And then we would start building something small like a school. <laughs> but it just shows you the power of using something so obviously overlooked, which has available resources, to build something that we need. And one of the things that happened is, as we were building schools, we just realized, you know, what about light? How do we bring light into this thing? Because all electricity is privatized. Nobody wanted to give electricity to the schools we built without some kind of guarantee. So we started getting bottles. Uh, we started getting bottles uh, of gin. And of course, in a month's time, we have enough bottles of gin to fill up the front of my, <laughs> to make a whole facade of, of, of glass. But really, it was, uh, we actually act told them, hey, can you donate also bottles filled with gin? We, why do we have to have it empty? But anyway, so they, <laughs> we, never, we never got it. So, but it's, it's just to prove to you that maybe a bottom-up approach is the most sustainable and, uh, solution of all. Now, I want you to look at this on the large scale about energy poverty, right? So I wanted to put a light to a school. Now, it takes me a while to ship a solar panel from abroad, manufactured abroad. Takes me about five months to get enough panels for my schools. So five months plus two months in customs. It could take up to three or four. And then finally, it gets to my school. Do you know that in the United Nations, the cost of logistics is 60 to 80 percent? So if you think about this whole thing about disasters, to get the solar light to the beneficiaries in scale, you buy it abroad, you ship it in, you fly it in, you truck it in. And so what happens is really in this whole thing about providing solar light, it's always about the expense of bringing it in. It's not about the cost in China or in India. It's about bringing it in. And so that was the passion. How do we localize it? How do we create this kind of solutions? And how do we spread it around the world? I'm so tired of going around the world and seeing a lot, lot of these uh, conventions where a lot of Filipinos are always asking a hand out. What I never see is us giving a hand to people that actually need it. I, I see volunteerism. Yes, we're part of the union, but we never, we never come up with a great movement to help other countries. We always are in a, in, a, in a one. We're always begging for something. So I said, wouldn't it be great for once, even if it's small, we come up with a solar solution, a community-based solar solution that we can open source and change the world. All of these countries over here, uh, most of the people in the developing countries live on less than $2 a day. And there is no way for them to afford solar lighting. So what did we do? One of the things we did was when we put the plastic, the gin bottles, we also put plastic bottles filled with water. And this allowed light to come through the walls and then refract. So instead of windows, we started putting lots of plastic bottles through the windows. We worked with Alfredo Moser, who's a Brazilian, and he was teaching us also about plastic bottles that can be put on the roof, refracted, and then light would come in through the roof. But what is litter of light? Litter of light is not that plastic bottle filled with water and bleach. But really, it, is, it was about creating this kind of sustainable lighting with community-built effort. In two hours, we should be able to teach a women cooperative to be able to build a solar light from scratch that is dependable, scalable, but at the same time that it can be maintained. If you don't teach them how to build it, they won't be able to repair it. It started out with a simple bottle, you know, the water and bleach. And then when they have more money, remember we put, it's about $2, we install it in the roof, they start saving electricity. Then we go back to them and say, would you want to buy an upgraded version? It costs only about $5. They put it inside, but more than that is during, during uh, disasters, we also go back to those groups and say, look, we have a lot of parts. Would you help us build solar lights for tents? Because a lot of people don't know that when you have these disasters, a lot of people go in tents, 
So once your candles run out, once your batteries run out, what happens is they use kerosene. And so there's an alarming number of children that, that are burnt because they're turning around in their tents and then knock off the kerosene and then they get burnt. Not only that, there are actually a heavy number of tents that burn down. So simple plastic bottle filled with water, put in a simple LED that's built by a circuit, built by women cooperatives. They actually earn, maintain, but at the same time, you can have lights for your house. If you have a house already, you put it on the roof, and you're able to have daylight and sunlight, the first place in the world that we actually use such a cheap technology to be able to have both day and night light. If you look at it, it's simple. Uh, this is the, the, one, the disaster model. We bring in a copper chip. It's scratched by hand, or you can make it more by ferric acid. But then, you know, with simple switch and then LED lights that we put together, you have a house light. Why do we always have to import? Do you know that importation, they design it to fail? The business model and the big failure of Philippine solar is it doesn't work. If you bring it in, they make sure a battery or your parts cannot be bought locally. So even if you go microcredit to make it available, 70% sometimes, by the time it goes about two years, by the time it also almost you pay it over, it actually breaks down. This one, you can repair it, fix it all the time. But the most important is, no matter what happens, we will be independent. Of course, we have crazy things that's happening, which is, you know, how crazy can you get with sustainable, uh, with sustainable systems? Can you, you know, have a solar light? Can you link it up to a windmill? I mean, the point is, when we start showing people that it's scalable, then the only natural way is that it's possible. We started out one with one bottle, one beneficiary, one carpenter who never heard about solar. And today, we're hitting about 150,000 daylights just in the Philippines. We're hitting about half a million in the world. We're in 15 countries around the world. And this year alone, we'll maybe hit 25. You know what's the most amazing thing? We go down there just with a bag, with maybe a few, a few solar panels, and almost everything else we buy in country. Imagine you can light a whole village, not by having a container van of millions of pesos worth of solar panels and finished products that will never get there, but you just go down there with a couple of solar panels, and with this one watt or two watt solar panels, it will be enough to light a village. I have a friend, uh, his name is Patrick Meyer, and he was so concerned about children getting you know, hit by cars when they're walking at night. Because of the technology and working together, he actually came up with a simple backpack that you know, you're walking all the way to your school, and then it charges, and then at night, you can have it light. I mean, why isn't solar more, more affordable? Fishermen that get run over by, by ships at night. Do you think people see this small little banca over there? But yet, they're in the hundreds of thousands. It's one of our main industries. How about, uh, you know, disasters? Why can't we do something? One of the things that we do is we take plastic pipes, we put it together. So wait, anyway, I'll show you how this solar is. This one built by women. We built about 5,000 of these lights in about three and a half months with this volunteer system. So basically, when you have light, it shuts off. And then when it, there's no light, it shuts on. Simple plastic bottle. This one, which is, uh, you know, you see this because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's where, you know, bulbs are screwed on. Solar panels are now ubiquitous in the country, but we can start our own solar industry. So what we do is we get thousands of women and we start distributing it, but behind them, there's also hundreds of women that assemble it. Ed Brisigno, one of our partners, wanted to just give a simple light for students because they were coming home to school without light. Of course, you have a gen set in the school, but then, you know, why not something where, you know, you can, you can actually... Oops, okay. It always function, malfunctions when you need it the most. Okay, anyway, so... So, anyway, so it's just one watt. But think about this. The future of solar... It's not in the large scale, in the complex financials. 
uh, the, the expensive professionals, but putting it in the hands of everyone, putting it in the hands of people that can solve their own problems. We go around the world. Uh, I go to places such as Colombia, where we have uh, 15 chapters, and we give access to light. We saw that by having more access to light, it actually reduces crime by almost 80%. So this year, we'll be doing 10 villages in 10 countries around the world, turning over technology, teaching the people themselves. Because once again, the purest form of charity is to make yourself obsolete. If you have to be there to make the difference, every NGO sometimes wants to be there. I'm here. I'm here to help you. I've raised the funds. I have the technology. I'm going to help you. So the purest form of charity is to get those people out. It's to make yourself obsolete and make the difference. If you can make them have a business, if you can make them build lights for their houses, if in a disaster you will be able to teach people how to make lights so that you know, they can secure, you know, make, make, make the path secure, make lights for their children to study, then you've made the greatest solar revolution of it all. And this is the way that the Philippine movement that started with a small but at the same time, made sure that everybody could be able to avail solar, of solar light, to be able to build it, maintain it, can be not about the big things that only help a few people, but the small things multiplied by the millions will be the greatest solar revolution of them all. Thank you.